Hey, Fletcher here, and welcome to episode four of Deconstructed, a retro set review where we take a look back at Magic the Gathering history through the lens of a single constructed set. We have finished the Mirage block, and today we will be starting a new block cycle, Tempest. The first set of the Tempest block, aptly named Tempest was released in October of 1997 and continues the Weatherlight saga put forth in Weatherlight. With Tempest, the flavor flows as this expansion is the first to use art and flavor text to visually tell the set's narrative through specific cards in the set. We open Tempest as the Weatherlight plane shifts from Dominaria to Wrath. Lying in wait is another airship, the Predator. The Predator is a Phyrexian airship captained by Griven Elvec, a commander in Volrath's forces. The Weatherlight is immediately boarded and a vicious melee begins on deck. Below, Mog Goblins search the Weatherlight for legacy artifacts. The Goblins find Karn and bring him back to the Predator. Back on deck, Gerard and Greven duel, just as it looks like Greven will win. The Predator cannons open fire. The blast knocks Gerard off the ship down to the forest below. As the Predator pulls away, Tangarth leaps onto the ship and is taken prisoner along with Karn. Back on board the Predator, Greven Elvec is furious with his first mate, Vadi Ildal, for ordering this cannon fire. Vadi's punishment is swift, and Greven tosses the man overboard and he falls to his death. Released on October 14, 1997, Tempest was the first set with a design lead that wasn't tied to the original MTG sets. The lead designer for Tempest was none other than Mark Rosewater, and this was his first set as a designer. For previous sets, Mark worked strictly as a set developer. To convince his boss, Mike Davis, and the rest of Magic R&D, Mark asked Richard Garfield to be part of the Tempest design team. Mark then recruited Mike Elliott and Charlie Catino as well, and the crew began work on designing the initial set mechanics and flavor for the set. Overly eager to impress, the team turned over a set so jammed full with mechanics and ideas that content was shelved for use in future sets. Cycling and Echo were two mechanics developed for Tempest that ended up being removed and implemented later in Urza Saga. Buyback and Shadow were the two mechanics that stuck with Tempest during the set's development. Unlike Buyback, the Shadow mechanic had a very important flavor tie to the story of Tempest. Wrath is an artificial plane created by the Phyrexians and used as a place to stage their future invasion of Dominaria. At the center of Wrath, we find the Stronghold, a military base and production center for Flowstone. Flowstone is a substance which binds with the plane, increasing its size, which is why the Wrath plane is so volatile. The plane itself also sits within very close proximity to the Dominaria plane. The plan is to continue to expand the plane of Wrath until it is large enough to envelop the Dominaria plane. The Phyrexians would then be able to use Wrath to freely enter and exit Dominaria and start their invasion. At times, the two planes have intersected and trapped Dominarians between the two planes in the shadows. These creatures are represented by three tribes in Tempest, the Soltari, Thalakos, and Dothi, who all share the shadow mechanic a keyword ability which limits a creature's interaction to other creatures on the battlefield unless they also have shadow. The other native tribes of Wrath include the Kor, Vek, and Dahl, the Elves of Sky Shroud, the Rootwater Merfolk, and Slivers. Back to our story, as Gerard plummets to the ground, he crashes through the Sky Shroud forest. And unlike Ilvec, Gerard luckily has his fall broken by the dense foliage and doesn't die. However, he is then attacked by Merfolk, escapes, and runs deeper into the Sky Shroud forest. Meanwhile, the rest of the Weatherlight crew lands the ship in the Sky Shroud forest to make repairs. 
Gerard, with the help of the Sky Shroud Elves, meets back up with his crew and they take the Weatherlight to investigate a mysterious gateway that they are told will allow them to return to Dominaria. Unfortunately, the gateway requires powerful magic to operate, and the crew has no choice but to head to the stronghold and confront Volrath. Urtai volunteers to stay behind and guard the portal. Now, while guarding the portal, Urtai is contacted by the Soltari Shadow People. Urtai pulls the Soltari Emissary into the Wrath Plane, and the two talk about the significance of the Shadow People and that of the portal. Meanwhile, the Weatherlight flies over the Cinder Marsh as it approaches the stronghold. The crew decides to sneak in by flying through the exhaust ducts in the marsh. After they fly in, the crew encounters a massive hive of slivers. They are overwhelmed at first, but soon discover that separating each sliver is the key to defeating them. Once they are clear of the sliver hive, they enter the Furnace of Wrath, which is one gnarly hut, electricity-filled oven. In the furnace, rock is melted down to create flowstone. A black oily byproduct is also produced, which is funneled into the next chamber the Weatherlight flies into, the Death Pits. The Death Pits are a collection of the discarded corpses, the failed experiments of Volrath. The collective conscious of the discarded beings are absorbed in the oily black ooze, generating a primal sentient being with a taste for flesh. Now out of the electricity-filled frying pan and into the oily pits of death, the crew is attacked by reanimated corpses. As Gerard holds off the carionettes, the rest of the crew runs down below deck. But as they retreat, Squee is singled out and grabbed by a group of the reanimated skeletons who start to grab him and carry him back down to the pits. With a blessing from the ship's healer, Orem, Gerard charges into the carionettes to protect Squee. Squee unknowingly activates his toy, which is a legacy artifact that ends up saving Gerard from the carionettes attack and the two are able to make it safely below deck. Thanks to the weaving of set and story, we have seen a great portion of what Tempest has to offer. However, there's still a great deal more to the set with plenty of power to boot. Some of the most awesome cards we haven't even talked about yet include my favorite, Curse Scroll. A one-mana artifact that tapped for two direct damage to any target if a player randomly picked a named card from your hand. This was a perfect addition to the already popular Mono Red Sly deck, which would remove the intended random successful activations of Curse Scroll by only having a single card in hand for your opponent to choose from. Curse Scroll gave Sly a solid late game when it ran out of gas, similar to how Hazaret is used in the Amonkhet standard build of Ramanop Red. Another innocuous artifact, Scroll Rack, a scalable brainstorm on a stick, was very useful in control style decks, including this interesting mono white prison build, the Kemp Monastery. This deck was brewed as an answer to the top tier five color black decks of the 1997 standard meta. The Kemp Monastery took advantage of the powerful board sweepers, tutor effects, and protection spells unique to the undefined white color pie of the time. Along with plenty of utility colorless artifact support and being able to dig deep into the deck with scroll rack, this brew was able to lock out creatures, gain life, and blow up lands with the long game plan of slowly eroding the opponent's will to play or library, whichever came first. Wasteland was, of course, first printed in Tempest, along with Lotus Petal, Reanimate, Living Death, Ancient Tomb, Time Warp, and Goblin Bombardment, which enabled the combo deck Fruity Pebbles that won by assembling a zero converted mana cost creature along with Enduring Renewal to go infinite with Goblin Bombardment activations. Propaganda, Meditation, Chill, Boil, Choke, Earthcraft, Overrun, Lobotomy, and Allurin are all also worth noting. 
However, Tradewind Rider and Capsize were another two of my favorite cards that saw a lot of play. Capsize paired very well with Sapphire Medallion, the blue medallion from the cost reducing medallion cycle in Tempest. And Tradewind Rider fit into just about any deck that wanted a 1-4 flyer who could easily run away with the game. In Tempest, we also saw the conclusion of the ATOG Mega Mega Cycle with Oratog. And we see the start of a new Mega Mega Cycle with Kindle, a spell that grows larger with each casting. Designed after Playgrat, this cycle will take a very long time to complete, not finishing until the release of Jeldoran Warcry in Cold Snap. The total amount of work that went into Tempest is staggering. The attention to story, art direction, set promotion, and overall card design that was generated by the Tempest team was astonishing. And not to mention the two mechanics cut from the set and development, Cycling and Echo, which were later implemented in Urza's Saga. Cycling is an evergreen mechanic that we see everywhere or the Helm of Possession designed by Mark Rosewater, which the rules of the time couldn't fully support in its original design, turned out to be the card Mind Slaver released seven years later in Meridian. Thank you so much for watching. And as always, what did I miss? What was your favorite card from Tempest? And what decks did you enjoy playing with these cards? Tune in next time as we see what happens to the Weatherlight crew as they exit the death pits and enter the stronghold itself. Thanks for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, help us out by clicking that like button down below. And to keep up on all the latest and greatest, click that subscribe button. Don't forget to hit that bell icon to get alerts whenever we have a new video. And check out some other sweet videos here and here.